This is the second revision video looking at the topic of rates of reaction. In the first video, we looked at how re rate of reaction can be calculated from experimental data, including a consideration of the kinds of properties of reaction mixtures that can be monitored using simple laboratory apparatus. So in this second video, we'll look at these learning outcomes. We'll uh, explain and use the term order of reaction in the context of a rate equation. We'll use data to be able to calculate half-lives, and we'll use a variety of experimental data to actually find the order of a reaction and hence construct a rate equation. OK, so let's remind ourselves then what we mean by a rate equation and hence the order of reaction. So rate equation shows how the rate of reaction depends on various concentration factors. Do be careful here that we don't confuse rate equation with the equation that you use to calculate a rate from experimental data, which is the change in concentration over the change in time. A rate equation is showing you how the rate of reaction depends on the different concentrations of reagents in a reaction mixture. And so typically, we might get this kind of rate equation. This, for example, would be a rate equation showing how rate depends on hydrogen peroxide concentration in uh, a decomposition reaction. Um, this is in the form of what we call a rate equation where you've got an equal sign and k, known as the rate constant, what that actually means is that rate is proportional to hydrogen peroxide concentration. So it's important to realise mathematically that these things do mean the same thing. If you are asked for a rate equation, however, you must give it in this form with an equal sign and the constant of proportionality there. And I'm sure you can remember that the number one in that rate equation is what we call the order of reaction. So for this very simple rate equation, this shows you a first order uh, rate equation or first order reaction. Notice, by the way, that that number one is quite often omitted in rate equations, and uh, you may often have to imagine that it's there in order to be able to clearly see that the reaction is first order. Now, rate equations are frequently not always as simple as that because often the rate will depend on several uh, concentration terms, several different reagents, and you'll get a rate equation that looks like this. So here's one for a reaction involving bromate ions, bromide ions, and H plus ions from an acid. And we can see here that all three of those concentration terms are included, but that there's a squared term for the H plus. Obviously, as we said before, you often have to imagine the number one um, on the right-hand side of these concentration terms here. So you might like to just uh, pause the video for a second and just uh, repeat to yourself the orders of the reaction with respect to each of the reagents and also perhaps uh, comment on the overall order of the reaction. So. What you should find is that because there are ones in this rate equation after these two terms, it's first order with respect to bromide and bromate, uh, second order with respect to H+, and oh, there we are, there's a bit of a trick answer there. The overall order is clearly not zero. It's simply the sum of all of the individual orders. So in this case, 2 plus 1 plus 1, in this case, would be 4. Okay, sometimes you're asked to calculate the overall order of a reaction. That simply means adding up some very, very simple numbers indeed. So that shouldn't prove too difficult for you. So we've seen how orders can be 1 or 2. And this gives some indication about the extent to which these particular substances here affect the rate. If it's first order, it means that rate is proportional to that concentration. If it's second order, it means that a change in H plus has a much greater effect on the rate. It's a squared relationship. So you might like to think to yourself, well, what would be the meaning then if something is zeroth order? So pause the video and just think about that. So zeroth order would mean that the substance does not affect the rate of reaction at all. Um, how can that be? Well, we'll look at how that might be explained by ideas about mechanism later on. Um, and the point being, of course, that if something is zeroth order, you wouldn't normally bother to include it in the rate equation. Sometimes, however, you will find that 
zeroth order reagents are included. Why would they do that? Well, it's often to emphasize that actually a particular reactant does not have any effect on the rate of change in that reactant. Concentration will not affect the rate. A good example of this is in the reaction of certain halogenoalkanes. So um, when that is the case, uh, when you break down halogenoalkanes by hydrolyzing them with hydroxide ions, for some halogenoalkanes, you find that the rate depends only on the concentration of the halogenoalkane and not at all on the concentration of the hydroxide ion that reacts with it. And to emphasize that, the zero is often included in the rate equation there. But you're perfectly entitled to simply write the rate equation as you can see here on the left-hand side. OK, so now we come to a critical part of the video, which is how we actually use experimental data to deduce orders and hence rate equations. Um, there are three methods for doing this. Two of them involve using graphs, and we'll come to those later on. But this first one is just using what I call raw data. So first of all, have a look at the data that we've got here in this uh, experiment, which has produced rather nice results. Um, this obviously isn't a terribly realistic set of data, but luckily the examiners are generally quite kind to you and tend to produce uh, tables of data in exams that uh, the, where the numbers are pretty easy to make sense of. So here's an example of that. So have a quick look at the data, make sure that you can understand what it actually means. Pause the video while you do so. OK, so we've got two different uh, reagents here, each of which may affect the rate of a particular reaction. And we've measured the rates of reaction in five different experiments. Now, it may look as though the numbers have been chosen almost randomly here. But if you look very carefully, that is far from the case. So um, have a look at what's happened, for example, in experiments one, two, and three. In experiments one, two, and three, the concentration of A has changed, while that of B has remained the same. Okay, um, And that enables us to be able to make some immediate deductions about the effect of changing the concentration of A on the rate of reaction. So see if you could have a think about how uh, the rate of reaction depends on the concentration of A, and then pause the video and work out, therefore, what the order of the reaction is with respect to A. OK, well, uh, what I hope you realise was that the order with respect to A was 1, first order. How do we get that? Well, if we look at experiments 1, 2, and 3, the concentration of B remains constant, but we first of all double the concentration of A. We should be able to see, despite some slightly awkward numbers, powers of 10 here, that the rate has also doubled. To check that, we vary the concentration of A again, double it between experiments 2 and 3, the rate doubles again. So as you double concentration, rate doubles, that's a proportional relationship that suggests first order. OK, now see if you can work out which experiments you would compare in order to get information about the effect of changing the concentration of B. So think about two experiments that you would look at in order to help you find the order of the uh, reagent B. OK, well, there's a couple of possibilities. Um, the most obvious one would be to compare experiment 1 and experiment 4. Why those two? Well, because in those two, the concentration of B changes. It's doubled, in fact. But the concentration of A remains the same, 0.1. So any change in rate would be due entirely to the change in the concentration of B. But look, you double the concentration of B, the rate doesn't change at all. Therefore, I hope you're able to deduce that the order is zeroth with respect to B. Also see if you can figure out a second pair of experiments that you could look at to confirm that order. And what I hope you were able to figure out is that you would also look at experiment 2 and experiment 5. A stays the same, B is doubled, but the rate is not affected. So again, zeroth order. So now just see if you can write down, therefore, uh, a rate equation for this reaction involving concentrations of A and concentrations of B. And so the rate equation should look like this.
Obviously, you could, if you wish, leave out completely the B term because it is zero border. And here's one for you to do yourself without any help from me. So pause the video while you figure out the orders with respect to NO and O3. And what I hope you deduce was this, that it's first order with respect to both of those. How do we obtain that? Well, as you can see, it comparing experiments 1 and 2, we've halved the NO concentration, kept O3 the same. Halving NO also causes the rate to halve. Now, comparing experiments 2 and 3, we have halved the O3 concentration, and again, the rate has halved, suggesting a proportional relationship for O3 as well, so first order there. OK, we now come to a second method for deducing order using graphs. And here we're going to use processed graphs that you might obtain from progress curves like this. You'll remember these from the first video. So the idea is that by plotting tangents from each of these curves, we're able to work out rates at each of these different concentrations. So we obtain a table of data looking something like this. Now, you could just use the raw data here to see that as you double hydrogen peroxide concentration, the rate pretty much doubles as well. But a much more precise way of doing this would then be to plot all of that data on what I call a processed graph of rate against concentration. And if we do so, we end up with a graph looking something like that. It's a straight line graph, and that suggests a proportional relationship, so it's a clear indication that this is first order. So it's first order with respect to hydrogen peroxide. Now, first order is by far the most common order that you can deduce from these process graphs, but you ought to be aware of what second order and zeroth order would also look like. So a second order graph would look like a curve here, where if you double the concentration, you'll notice that the rate goes up by a lot more than double. In fact, it goes up by a factor of four. And that is a clear indication that you have a second order graph. Um, it is possible to get other orders as well, but you won't encounter them at uh, A level. So if you find a curve looking something like this, you can be fairly certain we're looking at a second order process. If you plot a graph like this, and as you vary concentration, rate does not change at all, well, it's clearly zeroth order. And the third method is often the most familiar to you. Again, it's a graphical method, but this time it's using progress graphs directly without processing them in the same way we saw before. And it's using the idea of half-life. Just pause the video while you remind yourself what half-life means. So it's the time taken for the concentration of a reactant to fall to one half of its original value. And you may be familiar with uh, using lines like this to show the time taken, for example, to fall from 1.4 to 0.7, and then from 0.7 to 0.35. And what you end up with is a time interval, the distance between these lines on the uh, x-axis, which uh, you can actually easily work out from the date from the numbers on that x-axis. Just pause the video while you actually work out figures for those three half-lives on that graph. So each of these periods of time between these two lines here is about two and a half hours. And if you find that, that successive half-lives are approximately constant, you can deduce that the order is one. And that is, again, the by overwhelmingly the most common order that you'll deduce using this method. However, one very important bit of practical uh, planning that you would need to do if you were using this method is it'll only work if you uh, only allow one reactant to change in concentration over the period of the experiment. How do we do that? Well, you might like to pause the video while you think how to achieve that. And the answer is that you would aim to keep that reactant in um, the other reactants, rather, in large excess. So the reactant that you're allowing to change, you have in a much smaller quantity than the others. It will change, the others will remain pretty much constant. So a graph like this, where you have constant half-life, suggests first order. What about second order and zeroth order? Well, second order, you get a second order graph will give you half-lives that increase. In fact, they actually double as you measure successive ones. So it looks like a similar curve on the face of it, but the half-lives are clearly dramatically incre increasing here. With a zeroth order line, you get a straight line. And if you work out the half-lives, they actually 
uh, decrease. In fact, they halve as you kind of measure the successive ones. Although, to be honest, you hardly need to worry about that because the half-life is because uh, the, the graph is so obviously a straight line.